Berkeley for joining us. Just a glorious day to be above the mud. A true gift here in Central Virginia. So much to cover on today's program. We thank Skuma Boutique Dispensary for being a part of the show. The best dispensary in Charlottesville is located on the Downtown Mall and on Ellywood Avenue. Skuma Boutique Dispensary. We had a phenomenal time last night at the Clifton in Keswick with chamomile and whiskey, a packed house. Marie and Coda Curl just streaming, just, just, just playing and stringing the most beautiful music for um, a welcoming audience every Thursday at the Clifton in Keswick. You got fantastic cocktails and beers and food that will make your heart and your stomach happy. Yesterday was the first one and it was Dynamite. A lot to cover on today's show. We'll talk Joe Biden. Oh, Joseph Biden, the President of the United States, continuing to leverage my beloved, our beloved Charlottesville for political purposes, for political gain, weaponizing Charlottesville and rhetoric to drive, I don't know what his point is here. It's been five plus years since August 12th, one of the darkest days in Charlottesville history, undoubtedly a day that will live in infamy in our town. We are healing and trying to recover. Are we not? We've taken down Confederate statues. We've done our best to, to, to be inclusive. We're working hard to learn from the past. Yet the president, the most powerful man in the world, last night in front of a global audience, a global <clears throat> audience, mentioned Charlottesville in a negative light. Since August 12, 2017, Joe Biden hasn't stepped foot in the city of Charlottesville. Not once. Five plus years, our town, our beloved community, was the talk of the world. And Joe Biden hasn't even given us 15 minutes of his time in person in Charlottesville, yet he continues to leverage the Charlottesville moniker for political gain, weaponizing the brand, months before midterms. We'll talk about that on today's program. We will chitter chatter the Cavalier Daily, the newspaper at the University of Virginia, throwing darts at Glenn Youngkin. Look, this talk show covers both sides of the aisle. Earlier in the week, I was given Josh Thronberg, the candidate for the 5th District Congress, the one who's challenging Bob Good, the incumbent. I was giving him heat because of a campaign that seems to lack focus, a campaign that seems to lack acumen, a campaign that seems to lack penetration in the 5th District. Today I'm going to give heat to Glenn Youngkin. Earlier in the week it was Thronberg, the Democrat. Today it's Glenn Youngkin. Okay? Both sides of the aisle we cover. The Cavalier Daily... Their editorial board put together an editorial that I thought was absolutely on point. We will feature some of the highlights from the Cavalier Daily editorial today on the I Love Seville show, including slides that you have to read. On the board of visitors is a man that would absolutely shock you if you knew some of his background. Okay, and we're going to talk about Mr. Burt. Yes, you, Burt. And you trying to razor blade a sign off the door of a lawn student. And we're going to talk about some of the, the sketchy past Burt has had at the University of Virginia while a student here in Charlottesville. Both sides of the aisle are held accountable on this program, folks. We will chatter Chief Brackney today. She's suing the city of Charlottesville for $10 million. She's claiming she was fired because she was a black woman and not because of poor performance. Well, now the city of Charlottesville is saying it wants to dismiss the case and it's not going to pay Brackney a dime. We'll take a deep dive on this story on today's edition of the I Love Seville show. We will also chatter The Hook, the newspaper, served this community for so long the archive from readthehook.com has disappeared. Someone purchased the URL and the content that, that accommodated the content that accompanied 
the um, URL, all the stories, all the content, all the award-winning journalism from Hall Spencer, from Lisa Providence, from Courtney Stewart, from David McNair, it's gone. Readthehook.com was a reference point for so many. Now it's evaporated, it's disappeared, it's been purchased by a wealthy person because of how he or she was featured in this content. That topic on today's show, and Goldman Sachs is, is demanding their employees come back to work. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been saying this for months. The employer has the leverage now. In COVID, it was the employee. Now it's the employer. And the employer is telling people from Virginia to California to get their behinds back in the cubicles and in the seats. We'll chatter that topic, and we'll also talk something that is so very concerning. Inflation and the dollar are impacting Americans. A buck just is not going as far anymore. You wanna buy a Snickers bar at a grocery store? Remember when it was 50 cents, 75 cents? It's a dollar and 59 cents now. And that Snickers bar is smaller than what it used to be. So you're getting less Snickers bar for more money. So you know what's happening with groceries? They're so expensive. Who is shocked about the, gallon of, the price of a gallon of milk? Who is shocked of the cost of a pack of bacon? Who is surprised and taken aback with how much diapers and formula run? If you're young parents and you have two young kids and they're in diapers and utilizing formula to stay alive, those moms and dads are struggling financially. Grocery stores are trying to figure out a solution. And you know what that is? Buy now, pay later for groceries. Buy now, pay later might make sense, Judah, for a Ford Explorer at $40,000 where you need to finance it. Buy now, pay later. Does that make sense for a gallon of milk, a pack of bacon, some cantaloupe, some frosted flakes, some lucky charms? maybe some eggnog, a couple of T-bones, some broccoli. That's what's happening. Buy now, pay later for groceries. That should scare the bejeebus out of you. It's a microcosm of how vulnerable the economic climate we are living in right now. Since Jerome Powell spoke from Jackson Hole, what, 10, 12 days ago? The market's a bit in the pooper. In the absolute pooper. And today on Friday, before a three-day weekend, before no trading on Monday because of Labor Day, the NASDAQ just turned negative. The Dow is fighting to stay positive. The indices are reeling. Fragile is how I would characterize not only the global economy, but certainly the American economy. Judah, let's go to the two-shot. Let's welcome a man that has clout and influence, Judah B. Whitcower. A man who says earlier in the week that the Italian sub from Amato's in Maine is the best in the country. And lo and behold, Scott Aaronworth, the Esquire extraordinaire from Virginia Beach, the king of Virginia Beach, the biggest foodie in Charlottesville, is an attorney in Virginia Beach who comes to Charlottesville for foodcations. He will be here in a mere two weeks and change, and I'm hoping we can get some, nice. of, a, some of his most precious commodity, Judah, his time right here on the show to talk about his foodcation in Seville. You told him to get Amato's in Maine? I did not. You suggested Amato's in Maine. I said they had the best. You suggested Amato's in Maine. I said he they had the best $200. Italians. Yeah. He spent over $200 because you suggested it. It shows Judah Wickhauer's clout. Have you talked to our beloved Esquire? I have heard some uh, some news. In fact, I've got some pictures. Show the pictures. Put the pictures Let's on screen. See. Put the pictures on screen. How was a motto, Scotty Aaronworth? This is what he got in the box, at least most of it. Everyone, look um, at the screen. If you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, you're missing an aspect of this program that we call very dynamic photos and video that we put on screen. This Italian sub looks dynamite, Judah. Hold on. I'm going to show the sub in a second. What are you putting on screen? The pastas? Uh, he got... He got a pizza. He got a bag full of uh, full of bread. He got all the toppings for for the Italian. Looks like he got jars of like actual jars of stuff like pickles, oil. I don't know what else. 
I think he got some some whoopie pies. Does anybody know what those are? I don't know what a whoopie pie is. Uh, I may What's have a to... whoopie pie? Uh, How it's... much did you drop, Scott Aaronworth, on this order here? How I'll much was the total find, cost? Do you know? A picture. He sent it to you. What? Total cost of the order from Amato's in Maine to Virginia Beach delivered overnight. Italian subs, pasta, pizzas, and whoopie pies. Oh, I thought he sent it to you. What's the cost, Scotty? Would love it. Scott Aaronworth says great food recommendation. J Dubs, great mm. food. Okay, recommendation. here's a here's whoopie pie. Whoopie pie is a baked product that may be considered either a cookie, pie, sandwich, or cake. It is made out of two round, mound-shaped pieces of usually chocolate cake, and uh, with a sweet, creamy filling or frosting sandwich between them. Uh, it it's a main delicacy. Um, the whoopie I, pie is a main delicacy. I hadn't thought of whoopie pies in probably at least a couple decades. Are there whoopie pies in Charlottesville? I don't know. Does anyone and make here, a whoopie pie in Charlottesville? Can anybody give me some insight? Where can I get a good whoopie pie? I like saying the word whoopie pie. And here's the sandwich. MJ Arquette says, she's the queen of marketing. She says, what? Whoopie pie is a huge main dessert. Yeah. She's right. Yeah. MJ Arquette, you're A plus people. You so got, got the sandwich on screen? I've got the sandwich on screen now. Uh, we're going to have to wait to hear from Scott about how, how he liked uh, the food. He also got a pizza. Um, and like I said, the whoopie pies. But he did send this to me after sending the picture of the uh, the put together Italian, and he says, "O M G, the bread is floofing incredible." Wow! And I said, "I know, right? Never found anything like it anywhere else." And he said, "I love Bel Air, but this bread is perfect." Wow! Wow! So says the bread's better than Bel Air at Amato's. That was your call all along. Me, personally, I like the crunchy outer layer with the soft inside with my bread so my sandwich doesn't crumble and it can handle the Italian dressing that often makes the bread crumble and the ingredients crash to the plate, which leads, leaves me eating the Italian sub with a fork. One of the yeah. reasons I like the <clears throat> Anna's sub. Anna's number five yeah. um, on uh, Maury Avenue was because of that bread. Well, the great thing about the bread at Amato's is that they cut it down the center. I'll put up the sandwich back on screen. They cut it down the, the top center. So it's not like they cut it along the side and you've got like <clears throat> a half a millimeter of like bread at the, at the edge that just like splits the second you take a bite into it. This is like they cut it down the top. I believe they leave like a half an inch at least at the bottom. And then they kind of like put everything in the bread like I'm, i don't know you gotta, you gotta i mean it's on screen right is you it see still on screen yeah yeah look at the screen guys i mean that looks dynamite and who makes just, a sandwich like this in town guys nobody who makes a sandwich like this in town anybody give me some suggestions mj janice stephanie grayson steven who makes a sandwich like this in town? MJ Arquette said, we went this summer and learned that Booth Bay, Bar Harbor, Portland, we saw them everywhere, the whoopie, the whoopie pies. Oh, and yeah. she says, J squared, she's talking about you and I, um, we're A plus people. Right back at you, MJ. And I just got a, I just got a message from, uh, from Scott with half of the pizza saying, uh, pizza is very solid. He spent two hundred and seventeen dollars and eighty-three cents, based on a suggestion from the I Love Seville show earlier this week, and the influential Judah B. Wickhauer saying the Italian sub at Amato's in Maine is the best he's ever had. I'm and it glad. sounds like your suggestion was well received. I'm glad he liked it. I'm glad he liked it too, because two hundred seventeen dollars and eighty-three cents <laughs> is not cheap. No, it's not. That's a lot of money. Yeah. And the food came overnight via delivery. Yeah. Isn't it an amazing world we live in that you can ship? Italian subs and pizzas and whoopie pies from Maine to Virginia Beach overnight. It's an amazing world, is it not, Judah Wickhauer? It definitely is. He sent. Uh, I, I didn't. I didn't send myself the the photo to put it up because it's not the. It, but the uh, box says periship, perishable shipment, shipping solutions for the perishable foods industry. There you go. I love it. All right, let's get to some of the topics, Judah. I want to say this. On today's show, we're going to talk Yunkin and his Board of Visitors appointment. On today's mm -hmm. show, we're going to talk Joe Biden and what he said about Charlottesville last night. Earlier this week, we made the comment that Josh Thronberg in the 5th District has a slim chance to beat Bob Good in a gerrymandered district. Bob Good's an incumbent 
Josh Thronberg is an unknown, and I caught some heat for this on Instagram. Yeah. Anyone who watches this show knows that we hold all people, all parties, regardless of money, race, sex, political persuasion, we hold them all accountable. Yeah, they're all politicians, so you, they're can't, all politicians. Tr- so you can't trust any of them. We, we hold everyone accountable. We start the program with Joe Biden talking to the world last night. He referenced Charlottesville five plus years after August 12, 2017. He characterized Charlottesville in a negative light yet again. He is weaponizing the town that we all love so dearly. And for those that live in Central Virginia, please realize that you are undoubtedly tied to Charlottesville. You may live in Fluvanna, you may live in Louisa, you may live in Green, but how Charlottesville goes, your jurisdictions also go. So when the most powerful man in the world, the most powerful person in the world, characterizes Charlottesville in a negative light, and what in prime time, we should bristle at the least, be frustrated, angry, and irked, at the worst, get engaged politically, undoubtedly. The thing that irritates me, he's never come to our town. The thing that, go on. He continues to use Charlottesville and his rhetoric and the political propaganda, but he hasn't come to Charlottesville, walked Heather Higher Way, seen Market Street Park, or created a solution of any kind to help us heal. In five plus years, the president has not stepped foot in our town. From my standpoint, that's hypocrisy. From my standpoint, that's that's a a smoke and mirrors game. It's important enough to him that he brings it up into his primetime monologue last night, but he can't go from D.C. to Charlottesville less than two hours to put a little FaceTime in? That's hypocrisy. Your take, Judah Wickhauer. My take is that uh, in five-plus years, we've continually given a voice to the white supremacists. Like, it would have been a nothing on August 12th, and it should still be a nothing today. Like, does anybody know, does anybody know any of what was said at the park that day? Does anybody care? No. But instead, we made it, you know, people bust in to make it a bigger deal than it was, and by doing so, gave it a voice, and it has continued to plague this city, and it continues to do so with idiots referencing the, this nothing burger that should have been but wasn't instead because of giving a voice to crackpots. So you're saying he continues to bring this up. What he's actually doing is just continuing to give to platform. He's just continuing to platform white supremacy. I say every time, every time we talk about it, it continues to give a voice to it. I mean, it's been five years. Yeah. I mean, five plus years. It's not a coincidence this is happening on September 1st, two months and a couple of days before midterm elections. It's not coincidence that this is happening two months and a couple of days before a midterm election that many predict will be a red wave. Okay, let's read the tea leaves. And one of the ways for Biden and his party to potentially prevent a red wave is to conjure connotations, denotations, thoughts, and feelings of one of the ugliest days in our history. That's what he's doing. He's weaponizing us. And you know what? That really pisses me off. It really does. Because in these five years, I've seen the community have conversations it never had. Yeah. 
In these five years, I've seen the community galvanized. In these five plus years, I've seen people, white, black, brown, Asian, come together for the common goal of community goodwill and inclusion. Do we have a long way to go? Yeah, a super long way to go. Have we made some strides and some progress? Absolutely. Absolutely. Take me for example. Initially, prior to August 12th, five, six years ago, when this topic was front and center, my take on the Confederate statues was this. You can't rewrite history. Right. The statues are an homage to the past. But after watching how the statues hurt and impacted people in our community, I realized that maybe my perspective was not the correct or most applicable one. I don't think there's any one correct perspective, and I especially appreciated uh, Carl Brown's perspective that it would be better to use them as a starting point for conversations about the problems with them than to than to erase them and pretend they never happened. Or to an erect or to erect a Harriet Tubman statue, for example, next to the Robert E. Lee statue in Lee Park. That too. Why not have two statues? But my perspective changed. I realized how much hurt it was causing people. And as I realized how many people in our beloved town were impacted by these statues, I realized maybe it's time to change. And I think that's called maturation. When you start listening to others where you have an opinion that's different than others, but you listen to learn, to hear what others are saying and how aspects of life are hurting them. And then that broadens your mindset, your perspective. Maybe you guys disagree with me, but the most powerful person in the world continuing to utilize Seaville and Charlottesville and Charlottesville, Virginia, in propaganda and rhetoric, that seems to me as exploitation. That seems to me as smoke and mirrors, weaponizing, leveraging, out of touch, especially since he's never come here. Yeah. He's less than two hours away. I hear I don't know Air that, Force I don't know One that, is pretty fast. I don't know that coming here would do and it's not like there's Coming anything here would mean he's not no i understand walking out of I know, both sides of his mouth. i understand but he would be walking the walk and he would be talking the talk and then walking the walk because right now all he's doing is talking the talk that's all he's doing go ahead well like i said before i don't think he i don't think we should even be mentioning like there's no reason for him to bring it up i don't think him coming here would do anything there's nothing to see here Sure, he could see the sign that says Heather Higher Way, but that's not going to uh, influence his, his thinking or, or change anything about what happened or what he plans on doing wherever, or why he brought this up. I just think it's, uh, yeah, I just think there's no reason to bring it up. Travis and Danville. Jerry, every time he steps foot, steps foot in Virginia, he says something stupid. The last time he showed up to Danville, he said, quote, they're going to put y'all back in chains as part of a campaign stop. I don't know if it's confined to Virginia, though. I don't know if it's confined just to him. I mean, you got the governor of Virginia. Yeah. You want to segue to that topic? Sure. You got the governor of Virginia. Remember about a month ago when... We talked about the Board of Visitors, and we talked about Yunkin making appointments to the Board of Visitors. Yeah. And what do we say? Why would Yunkin appoint somebody who has been tied with attempting to razor blade a protest sign off the lawn? And Bert drove, 
Now, you and I split hairs on this. Bert drove from Atlanta, perhaps to razor blade the sign. Maybe he was doing some other things. <laughs> but the reality is he brought a razor blade to grounds at UVA, and he tried to cut a sign off a student's door because he didn't agree with the message. We're in agreement there, right? Yeah, more or less. Right? That's what he did. And he was stopped by the, um, the folks that wear the yellow shirts around grounds. They're not police officers, but they're in somewhat of a position of authority with, creating, um, with maintaining safety. Cavalier Daily and its editorial board then put out an editorial. You want to put some of the screenshots up? The uh, Yunkin screenshots? Yeah. Put them up. You should mention that this has less to do with what actually happened and more to do with the appointment. But This is... Um, Here's slide one, just the... Uh, it's cover. on screen? Yeah, get your facts straight, Mr. Yunkin. This is Bert Ellis. This is the Cavalier Daily, the newspaper of University of Virginia, and its editorial board writing a scathing editorial on Yunkin's appointment of Bert Ellis to the Board of Visitors. Here's the, <coughs> here's the first page of, quote, Ellis has been associated with a number of sketchy things. I, I characterize the razor blade, I describe the razor blade incident. You want to describe the second incident now? Eugenics? You want to go down that road? Give them the who, what, when, where, why. Uh, I think I need something to go off of. I don't remember enough of... I'll give, I'll give some perspective on that in a matter of moments. If you want to call up the Cavalier Daily article they've written too, there's the editorial and the story itself. Just type in Bert Ellis Eugenics and then read us the couple of graphs, the nut graphs from there. Please. All right, let's see. Eugenics is the study of how to arrange reproduction with a human population to increase the occurrence of heritable, inheritable characteristics regarded as desirable. Yeah, think Margaret Sanger. Ellis at the center of controversy over eugenicist speaker while at UVA. Read the first four or five paragraphs show. if you could, please. <clears throat> From May Day's protests to disputes over former President Hank Hereford's membership in the racially exclusive country club Farmington to the occupation of Cars Hill, student activism at the university was alive and well during the 1970s. One such newsworthy event, spawning a number of letters to the editor and articles, was the decision to host a debate titled the Correlation Between Race and Intelligence, featuring prominent eugenics supporter William Shockley during the 1974-75 academic year. And at the center of this controversy, recent Board of, of Visitors appointee Bert Ellis. When he was invited to visit the university in 74, Shockley's former accomplishments as a Nobel Prize winning physicist had already been overshadowed by his dedication to eugenic theories, turning him into an outcast in the academic community. Shockley did not have training in genetics, biology, or psychology. A white nationalist, he de dedicated decades in an attempt to prove that black Americans suffered from retrogressive uh, evolution. Yikes, that's pretty, I mean, that's... As bad as it gets. Yeah. That's as bad as it gets. That's from the Cavalier Daily. Cavalier Daily's done a great job covering this. So the Cavalier Daily, the student paper of the University of Virginia, they've written a number of articles. And the first article they wrote was Bert Ellis, the Board of Visitors, the guy who's on the Board of Visitors. The Board of Visitors pretty much determines the future of the University of Virginia, where the University of Virginia is going. Okay? They're Jim Ryan's boss. The Board of Visitors, Helen Dragas, to show how powerful she was at one time, she, she initiated a coup that got Teresa Sullivan almost canned, pink slipped, fired from UVA. That's how powerful these people are. The Board of Visitors, they're appointed by the governor. A spot opened up and Youngkin appointed Bert Ellis. Initially, I had beef. Remember on this show? Why would Youngkin appoint somebody 
that tried to razor blade a sign off the lawn. Everyone was left scratching their head, right? Yeah. Right? I think so. Now the Cavalier Daily does a little background, a little recon, a little research, a little intelligence, and they find that Bert, Board of Visitors, has ties to bring a eugenic speaker to grounds. So the Cavalier Daily puts this front and center as they should, right? As they should, right, Judah? Yeah, I'm still looking for the, uh, the Ellis part of this. Uh... And now the Cavalier Daily, their focus has gone from Ellis to Yunkin. And put the slides back on screen when you can after you, read, after you find the uh, nitty-gritty on that story. I'll read some of the slides. Here's some of the highlights from that editorial. Yunkin has proven himself to be an utterly incompetent leader. This is the Cavalier Daily talking. Yunkin has proven himself to be an utterly incompetent leader by failing to generally address criticisms, criticisms we have raised. Instead, choosing to disparage student journalism by spreading outright falsehoods about our paper. Simply put, we are tired of Yunkin's lack of leadership and find his politiz politization of higher education dangerous. If Yunkin were a competent leader, he would respond to our criticisms with sound reasoning and solid explanations. Instead, we get hollow platitudes. It is impossible to ignore Yunkin attempting to dismiss a 1970s controversy involving eugenics by characterizing it as a product of its time. It would behoove the governor to know that eugenics has been scientifically discredited in the United States since the 1930s. And they closed by saying this. Yunkin has placed himself in a tough position. Either he knew about Ellis's lack of judgment and chose to appoint him anyway, or he had no idea suggesting that he does not properly vet his nominees. That's my beef there. My beef with Bert Ellis is documented on the internet, on this talk show, on ilovesieville.com. He tried to razor blade a student's protest sign off their door. Now we realize that he tried to bring a eugenic speaker to grounds both are wrong and nasty. Did Glenn Youngkin, the governor of the Commonwealth, know? He certainly knew about the razor blading, the, the attempted razor, razor blading incident, Judah. That was news everywhere. Yeah. Youngkin knew about that before the appointment happened. Can't imagine Did Youngkin that. know that Ellis tried to bring a eugenic speaker to grounds? And if he did not know, what is worse in your eyes, Judah? What is worse? Youngkin knew. Ellis brought the eugenic speaker to grounds, or Yunkin was unaware that he did this? Considering the fact that it was 47 years ago, I've got to say it's, I, I feel this portion of it is a little, uh, a little overblown. Which part? That Ellis brought a eugenic speaker to grounds is overblown? Come on, please don't go down that road. 47 years ago? Yeah. People knew in the 70s that that was wrong. Okay. I'm, yeah. And that in the 1970s, people you don't think realized that eugenics was wrong? Please, come I, on. That's not what I'm arguing. I never said that, did Then I? what are you saying? I'm saying it was 47 years ago. So you're saying Yunkin may not have known he did this? I'm saying he may not have known he did this. I'm saying... Do we, do we still think that, uh, that Ellis believes any of this 47 years later? When I was 22, when I was 20, when I was 19, when I was 15, I realized that intelligence was not associated with race. Yeah. So did you. So did you. Right. And anyone even if it was 47 years ago, the 1970s, they had, they had any common sense to realize that intelligence is not associated with race. I find it, I find it very concerning. I find it very concerning. Ellis is the president of the Jefferson Council. The Jefferson Council is, is doing whatever it can to preserve the legacy of Thomas Jefferson on grounds at the University of Virginia. I believe Thomas Jefferson should undoubtedly, should yes, be included in the legacy 
of the University of Virginia, the school he founded. Certainly. I can't imagine him not be. Okay, exactly. Exactly. But I cannot stand by someone trying to razor blade a sign off a door, and I cannot stand by someone trying to bring a eugenic speaker to grounds. I just can't. Okay. Someone who's a student at the University of Virginia has the aptitude to realize that intelligence is a reflection of hard work, of effort, of reading, of commitment to learning. That's what intelligence is. It's not race related. This is backfiring on him. It's backfiring on Yunkin. And his response that it was a product of the time, I don't buy that. I think that's a lame excuse. And I think Yunkin should have perhaps considered this. You know, maybe I didn't do enough research on Mr. Ellis. And perhaps I made a mistake appointing him to the Board of Visitors. Maybe I should consider pulling him off the board. And you know, if Yunkin had gone with the approach of apologizing, admitting he made a mistake, and maybe pulling Ellis off the board, it would have endeared him with Virginians. It would have showed that he's human, because to make mistakes is human. Instead, he went with the approach, it's not a big deal because it's a product of the time. And he followed by attacking the Cavalier Daily. All he had to do was said, I made a mistake appointing this man. I didn't research him enough. I'm going to rescind his Board of Visitors position. And then Virginians would have been like, man, our governor is telling us he screwed up. He's apologizing to us. He was straightforward and open with us about his mistake. And he's asking for our forgiveness. And then he's going to reappoint someone else to the board. And if Yunkin had gone with that approach, Virginians on both sides of the aisle would have found it refreshing. He would have earned more political equity and political capital with that approach, as opposed to, no, 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 no. It's a product of the time. Bob Yarborough, the king of Redfields, we'll get to his comment. Love Bob Yarborough a man of reason. Maybe if Yunkin and Ellis would at least make a small attempt to own this incident, that it was wrong, that it was problematic, then maybe that would be a small step forward. Not likely, though. Yeah. He also says, Bob Yarbrough does, Yunkin's hubris simply will not allow that response. That's exactly right. Hubris, ego, a man who's <clears throat> uh, a CEO and founder of a, of a fin- finance firm, he's used to being the alpha dog in the room. Well, Yunkin's clearly got his eyes on the prize. Uh, Yunkin wants n- to be the president. And it has nothing to do with Virginia. Yunkin wants to be the president. Yeah. Everyone knows that. He's got grander expectations than governor of Virginia. This incident, I assure you, and I rarely use words like assure on this program, this incident, how he's handled this appointment of Burt Ellis, I promise you will come up if he makes a push for president. You agree with that? Yeah. And you know what the crappy part is? This is the crappy part. Are you with me here? Mm Mm-hmm. If Yunkin makes a push for president, Yunkin's opponents will utilize Burt Ellis, the University of Virginia, eugenics, and Charlottesville against him. And when Yunkin makes a run, either president or vice president, 
Charlottesville's going to come up again. And it makes me sad. It makes me sad. Yeah. It makes me so sad, man. It makes me so sad. I'm just disappointed with with him and 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 how it like causes this town to be collateral damage. It hurts me. I know it probably hurts you guys. It makes me sad. Danny O'Day. Danny O'Day is a reasonable man. A man of common sense. We don't agree on everything, but one thing I do agree with Danny O'Day is he cares about this community. He's very well read, very well informed very knowledgeable on a lot of topics. And he says, that's exactly what he should have said, Jerry. I don't think anyone is saying that personal growth is impossible. Hell, maybe he doesn't stand by the decision he made 50 years ago. I think it's more that he doesn't have to be associated with the university and choosing who represents the university is important. By standing by Ellis, Yunkin is really showing a lot about his values. Couldn't have said it better than that. I'm responding to your comment in real time, Danny O'Day. Comma, I could not have said it better. I completely agree, period, enter, publish, send it to him. You know, like, I've learned a lot about myself since marrying my wife, watching her birth our son, who's now four and a half, I haven't mentioned this on the talk show much, but we have a second son on the way. He's due around Thanksgiving. And we're very, very excited as mom and dad to be welcoming another little nugget into our family. Parenthood is the best, hardest thing ever and the longest, shortest thing ever. It's so hard but it can be so rewarding. And the thing I've learned from being a husband and a dad is I'm gonna make mistakes because there's no playbook to raising kids. You're gonna lose your temper. You're gonna get frustrated because you haven't slept. You're gonna get angry because the grocery bill is so high. You're gonna get these, this gambit of emotion, and it can all happen on one day, one single day, right? You could have this like, man, I'm so proud of my son. Man, my son pisses me off. Man, he's making such bad decisions. Man, look at him hit that squash ball and that baseball. I'm so proud of him, all in the same day. And what I've learned, Judah, and I think you've even seen it seep into this office. Maybe you disagree. You and I have worked together. This company is almost 15 years old. You and I have worked together for 10 of those 15 years. 10 years ago, I hope I was a very different Jerry than I am now. A little more laid back. And it's because of him. It's because of her. To err is human. To forgive is divine. Right. And how we as men and women go about acknowledging our mistakes, learning from them, and holding ourselves accountable for the mistakes we've made to grow as people, that's called what? It's called maturing and being a better man or woman. Youngkin could have told everybody, I screwed up. I didn't vet this guy well enough. I didn't vet this guy well enough. Or heck. Or he could say, look, I understand you guys have problems with this appointment, but here are the reasons why I think he's right for the job. At or, least that would give us something, right? Instead, he chose to say it was just a product of the time. Almost a flippant response. And then he ripped 
students who are running a newspaper. That always goes over well. Right. You don't fight a war with men and women who battle with ink and keyboards and microphones because that's not going to go well with you, go well for you. And for those that are listening to this program, watching this program, or watch what we post online, please, please, please realize, regardless of political affiliation, we're going to hold you accountable on this talk show. If you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, whatever the hell it is, we're going to hold you accountable. And Biden, we held him accountable at the start of the show with his exploitation of Charlottesville. And Yunkin, we're holding him accountable now with how he's managing this appointment. Oh, man. New topic, please. Chief Brackney, Charlottesville City Hall. Charlottesville City Hall looking to dismiss the case, J Dubs. She's asking for 10 million bucks. Mm hmm. Former police chief is claiming she was canned, pink slipped, fired because she was a black woman. Charlottesville City Hall is saying, not so fast, my friend. You were canned, you were fired, you were pink slipped because of poor performance. Now up to a judge to determine this. Yeah. The dismissal of the lawsuit, yes or no, whether it goes forward or not. Guess what's in the national news? This. Washington Post is covering it, left and right. In one week, Judah Wickhauer, in one four-day period of time, Joe Biden references Charlottesville and white supremacy. In one week, one four-day period of time, Glenn Youngkin is in the global national news for Bert Ellis and eugenics. And in that same week and four day period of time, Chief Brackney in Charlottesville City Hall in a $10 million lawsuit about being a black woman and getting fired because of it is in the national news. In the same damn week, Judah. It's an easy target. It's an easy target. That's exactly right. And it stinks. Yeah. And it genuinely, it genuinely, genuinely, genuinely hurts my soul. Genuinely hurts me. Scott in Virginia Beach says, Duncan Yunkin has lost my vote for president when he steps over Virginia on his way to his master plan. Scott, you're a good man. Scott identifies with the party of common sense, just like we do in this studio. Only time will tell what happens with the Brackney lawsuit. I've made the strategic branding play of keeping this story out of the news cycle by just giving her a couple of million bucks including in that couple of million bucks on non-disclosure where she is gagged <clears throat> and can never talk about Charlottesville again. She continues to utilize social media, specifically Twitter, to attack Charlottesville. You give her hush money. Take this hush money and stop talking about us, and it keeps it out of the Washington Post news cycle. You disagree with it? I know you do. We can agree to disagree on this topic. Well... Paying her doesn't keep anything out of the Washington news cycle. Uh, Paying her would continue, would yeah, keep it the would story keep from her, getting momentum. I get that. And just uh, the idea of hush money is... Mm, happens all the time. That doesn't make it... A, happens all the time. <clears throat> you could say that about a lot of things. That doesn't make any of them right. You know, with governing and politics, there's no right or wrong. It's just gray area. That's it's good the, to know. It's, it's, it's the best. What is the best of a crappy situation? And that's why 
we have the politicians today that we have? It's not going to change. Because everyone would like because the because the people that the people that r rise up, raise their hands, and say, "I'd like to do the job," are people, sadly, who I think believe what you believe. Rain, Cotty, Mannernick are watching the program. Once a dad, always a dad. Even when they grow up, the wonder of being a parent keeps us going. There are ups and downs, but we never give up. When our son had his very serious mental health issues, it would have been so easy to just to give up. He never gave up, and we never gave up. Being a parent is a precious gift. Peace to you. Thank you for that comment. Thank you for that comment. Period, enter, publish, send it to him. Oh, man. It's one week, man. Three different stories. Three different ways in the news cycle. All right, next topic. You remember the hook, the weekly newspaper? Yeah. You love the crosswords and the Sudoku puzzles. Yeah. Every time Judah was on break, it was a crossword or Sudoku puzzle, right? Yeah, either, either from them or from SIBO Weekly. Weekly. A lot of people don't realize this. The Hook and the SIBO Weekly at the end were owned by the same company. Blair, Kelly, Bill Chapman, Hall Spencer formed an alliance to vertically integrate the companies, economies of scale, save money on printing, back-end support, human resources, accounting, sales teams, they combined the companies to help improve profit margin. The unfortunate nature of this merger was the hook, the newspaper that created the real journalism, um, folded. And now we're left in Charlottesville without a true watchdog. Yeah. The Daily Progress has one reporter, no ties to Charlottesville, this one reporter has. She's doing her best. She's got no ties to Charlottesville. She's very, very young. And she's asked to cover the entire Central Virginia region by herself. That's because Lee Enterprises is slashing budgets left and right for their daily newspaper holdings. The Hook was the paper that held the politicians and the stakeholders and the developers and the financiers accountable. Courtney, Lisa, Dave, and Halls were award winners. Yeah. Award winners. When the SIBO Weekly and Blair Kelly and Bill Chapman and Hall Spencer chose to eventually fold the hook, their content was archived online for years. Readthehook.com. Readthehook.com. God, I used to go to that website so much. Lisa and Courtney and Dave and Halls, your content was so good, man. I love reading your news. I love reading the comment section below it. No one's filled a void since you guys have folded. Well, lo and behold, recently, and I'm going to read verbatim from the petition. You can find this petition on change.org. Dave McNair started the position. Dave McNair from the DTM. He's still doing good work at the DTM. He says, last year, the publishers of Seville Weekly, who also published the Hook newspaper before they shut it down in 2013, transferred ownership of the Hook's website to an anonymous buyer. Earlier this year, that anonymous buyer removed the website archive from the internet, effectively erasing over a decade of award-winning local reporting from the internet. Sevo Weekly's publishers, that's Kelly and Chapman, have so far refused to explain why they made the decision to sell the website archive to an anonymous buyer. Well, we know why they did that. Why did they sell the website to an anonymous buyer, Jim? Money. Yeah, to make money. Because the Seville is hurting. Ad sales are down. People don't read print. And because the journalism isn't as investigative as it used to be, the readership is down. So they sold the URL and the content to an anonymous buyer because they want, it's a for-profit business. Dave McNair continues. The Hook won over 150 awards from the Virginia Press Association during its 12 years of publication. While other fine newspapers in town have won VPA awards, 
The Hook also won the VPA's highest honor, the award for journalistic integrity and community service three times. To put that into perspective, the only other newspaper in Charlottesville to win the award, which was first handed out in 1947, was the Daily Progress in 1964. It was not uncommon for the Hook to follow news stories very closely over time, building on, a past, building on past reporting with new information and thereby creating a powerful archive of that particular subject or issue. For example, when the Hook covered the attempted ouster of UVA President Teresa Sullivan, the story for which the paper won the VPA's Award for Journalistic Integrity and Community Service in 2012, there was no stone left unturned. The Hook's coverage provides extensive background and detail on local stories that received national attention for weeks. Now he continues, all this copy is on the change.org petition, but I'm going to read the last two paragraphs from it. Unceremoniously removing the Hook website, which was expertly archived, easily searchable, and available across the web in general searches as the new anonymous owner did this year, is nothing le less than erasing history. We are shocked and saddened that Sevo Weekly's publishers who worked closely with us in developing the hook after they became owners would transfer ownership of a web archive of our work and to an individual or organization too cowardly to identify themselves in an apparent catch and kill operation and with so little regard for local journalism. Here's what's happened. And this is me talking. For those that are listening on Spotify and iTunes, this is now me talking. The domain and the content were purchased by a wealthy individual. We won't say who. That wealthy individual had every right to purchase that content. And once that content was purchased by the wealthy individual, that individual could do whatever he or she wanted with it. Did they delete history? Yes. Did they erase history? Yes. Are people saying that you can still find this content on the Wayback Machine? Are you familiar with the Wayback Machine? I was going to suggest that. But Give them some details of the Wayback Machine. I mean, it's, uh, we're, talk a, we're talking about archives. It's an it's archive itself. Archive. It's, basically, uh, it's basically a series of snapshots. I don't know how it decides what days to choose, but you can go and input a URL and it'll give you basically a series of calendars and it'll usually have like one or two or three days out of the year that, have, that are highlighted. And you click on those and it shows you basically a snapshot of that web page at that date and time. And I'm sure all of those articles can be found on the Wayback Machine. The problem would be finding them, and then what do you do with them? Like, somebody would have to actively... Here's what's unfortunate. ...copy and paste all that information. Right. Here's what's unfortunate. Yeah. People can easily go to readthehook.com to find the content. It's a brand. People knew it. They knew to find the content there. A hell of a lot less people know back know about the Wayback Machine. You would agree with that, right? Yeah. This is not a vehicle of content that is widely known about by a lot of people. Furthermore, the person who purchased this content now owns the content. They have the rights to the content. When you write an article in the Daily Progress, I used to work for the Daily Progress. I used to work for NBC29. I used to work for ESPN Radio. I used to work for Monticello Media. Freelance for the Star Ledger, Miami Herald. The writers who produce the content don't own the content. They don't own the content. Okay, what are you getting, what are you getting at? Someone can't take the content from the Wayback Machine, then take that content and go archive it on a new website called readthehooknow.com. Well, they could. They'd get their ass sued. Well, if... They'd get their ass sued. If the guy's wealthy enough and aggressive enough, Judah, to buy a, a URL for a defunct newspaper just to save his or her brand image, 
which is what's happened. Okay. You don't think they would go then sue somebody who's util utilizing his or her content without his or her approval? I think it depends. On what? Uh, maybe you leave out the content that's uh, calling him out for whatever. They won't know who it is. Who owns it? Fair enough. How would they know? I don't know. And if they make the mistake of publishing the content on a new URL that, fe that, that features this wealthy individual, this wealthy individual will drop the hammer on them and sue the bejeebus out of them. Because okay. this wealthy individual now owns the rights to the content. All right. If they're aggressive enough to buy a defunct newspaper's archive, they're certainly going to be aggressive enough to drop the hammer on a, a new website that's utilizing content they don't own the rights to. Fair enough. Does journalism need to evolve into a public utility? Is the best way for journalism a nonprofit model like Virginia Mercury or Cardinal News? Charlottesville Tomorrow is a nonprofit model. They do a good job. They are kept online by donations. Would I like to see more content produced by Charlottesville Tomorrow and Giles Morris's team? Yes. When Brian Wheeler was running Charlottesville Tomorrow and Sean Tubbs was employed over there, they were publishing considerably more content than what Charlottesville Tomorrow was doing now. I'm a news junkie. Danny O'Day's a news junkie. Bob Yarborough's a news junkie. Scott Aaronworth's a news junkie. Judah Wickhauer's a news junkie. Janice Boyce Trevelyan's a news junkie. Give us news, please. We, Judah and I, do not want to be the originators of news in Central Virginia. We want to analyze the news. We want to talk about the news. We want to offer you our commentary on the news. We want to take a press release that was published and say, let's unpack it and see where it can go. But we don't want to be the originators of the news. We do not want to be the originators of the news. How does a community that has one of the best universities in the world have one reporter on the daily newspaper, have a, a musical chairs turnstile at the editor for the weekly, Sevo Weekly can't keep its editor, the television stations are our, our, our farm systems, minor league systems for, for reporters looking to get some experience. They stay 18 months, 24 months, and then they leave. CJ Pasco, NBC29, just, just announced he's moving to New York with his wife. He's leaving NBC29. There was a time when NBC29 had Henry Graff, who's now in Richmond, and damn, he was a good reporter. Matt Tallheim. He's somewhere else. And Dan, he was a good reporter. The market is not robust enough for reporters to make a living within it. And because it's not robust enough from an ad dollar standpoint, the reporters are paid very little money. And because they're paid very little money, they leave. Allison Rabel, phenomenal. She covered Almore County. She left. Catherine Knott, Education, Daily Progress. She left. GD Bixby, City of Charlottesville. She left. It's not a large enough market to sustain journalists long term. Maybe it's a public utility now because social media and digital marketing is cannibalizing what was otherwise print and television and radio dollars. They're dying a death of a thousand cuts and how they're trying to sustain themselves is by cutting payroll, which means you and me, the citizens, s we suffer. 
Oh, the hook archive deleted. God. All right. Two other topics that I'll cover myself, and then I want to get to buy now, pay later for groceries with you, Judah. Okay. Um, <coughs> Goldman Sachs has ordered everybody back to work. The tech companies are laying off a lot of people. Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Snap. The leverage is now on the side of the employer where the leverage used to be on the side of the employee through the pandemic. Goldman Sachs says, if you don't get back to work, you don't keep your job. Elon Musk tells Tesla employees, if you don't get back to work, you're not working for me. Cold as ice. I'm torn on this because I know if people get back to work, an area like the downtown mall will benefit because there will be more people on the mall going to the eateries and the restaurants and the, and the bars and the coffee shops and the retail outlets to spend money on their breaks, lunch, on their break, after work, before work, after work for happy hour, cocktail hour, dinner time with their significant others or coworkers. I also realize, I also realize that hybrid work from anywhere has many benefits. It's better for the environment, less cars on the road, more quality of life, less time in transportation, more time with your family. It's not a clear cut right answer. You take away the bodies from the offices around the downtown mall, around Midtown, those businesses will suffer mightily and the big box stores will win. Mark that down. Goldman Sachs, get your tail back into the office. Elon Musk, get your tail back into the office. That's going to continue. Mark it down. One other topic before we get to buy now, pay later groceries. I mean, mother, that terrifies the bejeebus out of me, Judah. Yep. UVA's home opener is tomorrow <clears throat> at 12.30 p.m. They play the Richmond Spiders. It's the first game of the season. Brennan Armstrong, the Southpaw quarterback, is going to be a shortlist Heisman Trophy candidate. Having the football season back in um, operation is good for the entire community. It's good for businesses. It's good for the corner. It's good for Midtown. It's good for downtown. It's good for Preston. It's good for the hotel years. It's good for the vineyards. It's good for the breweries. It's good for the wineries. It's good for the retailers. It's good for everyone. It's good for Charlottesville's economy. 12.30 tomorrow. My fingers are crossed that this is a damn good season. I love Tony Elliott, the head coach. I love his Clemson background and his pedigree and how he carries himself and what he has said so far. 12.30 kick, Richmond Spiders, game airs on Masson. Two shot if you could please, J-Dubs. Last topic of the day. We'll get to your comments too. Chime in with comments if you want us to relay something on air please. Buy now, pay later. Charlotte Woods, Danny O'Day is right. Charlotte Woods of Charlottesville tomorrow just left. Did she go to the Richmond Times dispatch, Danny? Did she go to the RTD? Um, set the stage for buy now, pay later groceries, Judah. I mean, that's pretty much it. It's uh, the idea that people are starting to use... Uh, so I don't know much about Klarna or Affirm, but it sounds like they're, I mean, it sounds like it's basically uh, a different form of credit card. It's like a, an app that lets you, uh, helps you pay for stuff now, and then you pay them for the service later. But uh, Why does that scare the hell out of you? Because it's one thing when you're using that on a you know truck. a two hundred dollar purse or yeah I don't know if a truck would be too expensive to to use an app like this uh, you know but uh, you want to you want a leather jacket and it costs too much and you, it's basically layaway in app form but can can you imagine putting food on layaway? Or even Buy. worse, buying it now, and then you know, the the debt comes uh, comes due later. I mean, 
It's a microcosm. It's, it's bad enough if you're using your credit card for that. It's a microcosm of vulnerability. Yeah. It's a snapshot of how vulnerable we are as Americans financially. And underlines. Don't have the money to buy groceries to feed your family. Underlines the, the credit problem we're uh, getting deeper and deeper into right now. Biggest debt in American history right now. Biggest debt in American history. Housing has slowed to a standstill. Americans are using credit cards to pay bills. And everyone is undoubtedly terrified that the next shoe is going to fall is Americans taking the equity of their houses to pay their bills. And speaking of credit, uh, I'm surprised we haven't, uh, we haven't talked about this or heard more about it, but uh, have Bob you says heard? that sounds predatory and, explo and exploit, uh, sounds like predatory and, a, and, and an exploitation of citizens. Well, speaking of which, uh, we haven't talked about this yet, but uh, has anybody heard about Bank of America's new uh, uh, zero down mortgages? For black and Latino users. You want to give us the background? I didn't hear about this. I wish you had sent me really? this today. I, you know, I was, I was sure that, uh, that Keith would bring it up, but that's not de exactly the road that you guys went down. Um, so I can understand how it didn't come up. I'm sure he must have heard about this, but uh, let's see. This is from CNBC. Quick, uh, Bank of America launches zero down payment mortgages to help minorities buy their first homes. At first blush, it sounds like a great idea. But it's specifically for black and Latino borrowers. Yeah. And, you know, helping, helping minorities, helping people who are down on their luck, you know, get into a home. I think there's, that's incredible. That's great. But as Keith has often mentioned on his show, when somebody came to him and offered to pay him money to take out a loan, he said, get out of my office. And the fact that this kind of thing, it, you know, the people that are going to be getting these loans are not going to be savvy on what, what the dangers here are. And, dude, Bank and, of America is launching this in five cities, Charlotte, Dallas, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Miami, only for black and Hispanic home buyers. Their, their credit scores are not being taken into effect. Right. You can have terrible credit and you get the loan. You can have terrible credit, get the loan with 0% down. Now, uh... Just to, just to illustrate the opposite side of that, I did read somewhere that they have other ways of making judgments in terms of looking at, somehow they have ways of seeing you know, how, how often they've been on time with rent payments, things like that. So there might, it might not be you know, completely just, hey, we're going to give these to anyone, anywhere, doesn't matter. I think there is going to be some amount of judgment involved. But we are talking about, you know, we're talking about zero down payment mortgages. I mean, these that's were just... the type of financing vehicles. That's what got us into 2008. This was 2008, dude. Judah's exactly right. Judah Woodcower is a smart man. 2008, 2009, 2010, Keith Smith likes to joke a cup of coffee could get a mortgage. Now in five cities of America, is Bank of America the largest bank in, in, in our country? Can you look that up? Yeah. Now Bank of America is allowing black and Latino borrowers in five cities in America to get a loan with no money down and with no credit score check. These were the type of loans that were being created. These are the type of loans that were being originated. These are the type of loans that were being given in 2008, 2009, and 2010. And how about this statistic from the National Association of Realtors? Seven in 10 white households own homes. Four in 10 black households own homes. And five in 10 Hispanic households own homes. You pray, I pray, Cross our fingers and hope to God Bank of America is coming at this from a genuine, altruistic mindset. And we'll provide, hopefully, I would I pray uh, that they would be providing uh, safety nets as well. Yeah, 
But did so you see that, that you don't need you don't need uh, pro, you don't need mortgage insurance for this? I mean, it just sounds like a recipe for disaster. This it, sounds and, too and good not to be the, true, and not for the banks. The banks no. are going are always going to profit, but I fear that you're going to end up with a lot of people end up defaulting and losing homes. And where are you then when when you you're out? When you're out of money, out of options, when you know, I just I, I I feel like this is just a terrible idea and a scary time uh, to be looking down the barrel of this gun. And to answer Bob Yorbo says this: this is not completely dissimilar from the Habitat model. I ask that maybe you guys give this a bit more thought. This okay. is different than 2008. I respect Bob Yarborough. I totally will give it more thought. I would love to learn more how this is different than 2008, Bob, yeah. and how it could be beneficial and advantageous. Agreed. I would, I'm open-minded to learning more. I would love to learn more. Our concern is 2008, people were getting loans that should not have gotten loans. Yeah. And generally, I'm- the standards for getting loans are down payments, and credit scores. Yeah. Our concern is also that banks have never looked out for anyone except for themselves. Exactly. And this seems... I don't trust a little, banks. A little too altruistic to be... Uh, uh, to be... Comfortably... Legitimate. In the... Uh, to be honest. But I would love to learn more. Yeah. Your is a smart man. Yeah. If... If this is genuine, I, like I said, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing providing opportunities for for low low income and for minorities uh, who have never to get into home ownership. Who, who've never, yeah, have never had a chance to to buy a home. Kathy Kathy Gelbert says you're doing a great job. Thank you, Kathy. I miss you at church. Oh man! All right, that's today's show. You did a great job today. Thank you. you really have done a fantastic job on this show. Um, Bob doesn't trust banks either. The, the banks, they look after themselves. Danny O'Day says, King DOD. Danny O'Day's a smart guy. Like we were talking about the other week, Jerry, everything is up for rent. Now we're basically renting out our ability to eat food. Yeah. Charlotte Woods went to the Richmond Times Dispatch. He does make a good point about Goldman Sachs. They hold three point five billion in commercial real estate holdings. Could they be forcing their workers back as a way to justify their portfolio and help stave off commercial real estate crash? I think that's part of it. I think that what was if- also part of J.P. Morgan and Jamie Dimon wanting people. J.P. Morgan's another one that's demanding people to get back to work. Goldman well, Sachs speak- and J.P. Morgan own real estate, so they need real estate not to crash. Oh, oh well. Speaking of banks and real estate. This is a ter- this is an even more terrifying thought. What if what if these uh, what if these loans are a way of creating bag holders, getting rid of that, getting rid of those uh, crappy debt? No, getting rid of their real estate holdings. Walk walk me through that. You're a bank. You're looking at the, the real estate market right now, realizing that you've made a mistake buying too much real estate that you can't do anything with and is in a bad position. So you decide to give easy to easy to give loans to a bunch of people who are desperate to get into homes and you drop a lot of this, uh, you know, these poor real estate purchases that the bank has made onto, uh, onto minorities, leave them as the bag holders when the, uh, when the market turns. It's, you know, I'm not saying that that's what, that's what, no, what's going to happen, it's a great but question. it's another terrifying thought. It's and great question. Oh, three-day weekend, my friends. Recharge, revitalize, re-energize. We're off on Monday. Jude has uh, got a photo shoot for his poster. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, looking, just, I'm looking for my sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spend time. Anybody, anybody have an old, uh, an old 80s, late 80s, early 90s sweater that I can borrow? If you have a late 80s, early 90s sweater, please send it to Judah for his poster. He'll sign, he'll sign you a copy. The Dow is now at a session at session lows. Uh, all right, that's the talk show. We will see you Tuesday on the I Love Seville show, where we showcase the best of Charlottesville and Central Virginia, and we'll always 
always, always champion the underdog. Judah Woodcower crushed it. My name is Jerry. Keep it local. Go Hoos. And remember, every dollar you spend in your community stays in your community. Don't do that online nonsense. Keep it in the community. Even if it costs a little bit more money, you will win in the back end. So long, everybody. Have a great weekend.